who is based over on the West Coast in Helensborough and was many years at the peace camp. And Jane's going to give us a kind of background explanation, a first principles, I guess, as to what the convoys are all about. So over to you, Jane. Thank you, Kenneth. Right, I'm going to share my screen, the magic of technology here. Um, this one, this one, okay, and okay, are we quite there? Slide change, beginning. Oh, I see, it wants me to clear that. Right, that's it. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm Jane. Uh, I'm a coordinator in Scotland with Newcorch. Um, I've been monitoring, following, campaigning against nuclear weapons convoys for 37 years. And I'm going to try and distill that to you in eight minutes. I've practiced. Okay, so um, this is really basic stuff. And some of you will know it and some might need reminding and some are new to this, so we're going to take it from the top. So the nuclear, the Trident nuclear weapons system, we have four Trident submarines here in the UK. Uh, one is usually in refit down in Devonport and Plymouth, and one is usually at sea on patrol. Um, uh, no, always at sea on patrol. The, they can carry 16 missiles, but they have no more than eight operational missiles on them at any one time at the moment and they have a maximum of 40 warheads per submarine. So what does a warhead look like? That's a top of a missile that's in a museum in uh, America, and I've actually seen this thing. Uh, so that's, that's those great big black pointy things are the warheads. Um, a warhead basically is like a thin traffic cone. It's only about three feet high, considering what it does, it's not very big. And each of the UK's warheads is 100 kilotons. And a reminder, the Hiroshima bomb was 15 kilotons. So warhead is essentially a, a lump of radioactive materials surrounded by high explosives. Um, they, well, so why are they on our roads then if they're based on submarines? Well, they're actually manufactured down south near Reading. The um, core is made at Aldermaston. That's taken to Burfield where it's constructed into the, the actual warhead. And then it has to come up to Coolport, which is the uh, where the armaments depot for Trident. A lot of people know Fast Lane quite well. That's where the submarines are berthed. But just round in the next lock over at Lock Long is the armaments depot. And so they have to get from Burfield to Coolport. The pictures there, that's the high, the high security area at Cool port and below it, that's the explosives handling jetty where the submarines go in for the warheads to be changed over. So obviously to get from Burfield near Reading up to Coolport, 30 miles north of Glasgow, has to come along roads. Uh, these are the routes that we know it currently uses. Um, it usually takes two days to get here. It has a break overnight somewhere around north of Yorkshire, one of the bases there, and also stops for various tea breaks along the way um, in places like DSG Stirling and Glencourse Barracks in Pennycook. What is it transported in, these warheads? Well, this is a warhead carrier. Um, it's 44 tonnes. It's got seven axles. It's the heaviest truck that's allowed on UK roads. It's a Mercedes-Benz Acros unit for those that are into that sort of thing and usually a convoy has three or four of these and we believe that each one carries two warheads. Um, the rest of this convoy is all the security and the backup stuff. This is a picture of it on the M74 um, from last month and so with it, it will have, as well as all the, the, the security vehicles, it'll have a fire engine, a breakdown truck, a coach, a repair workshop, and usually about 26 vehicles are all, and it travels sometimes in two or three separate parcels with a space between. And how do we know about this? How do we know what routes it goes on, what it does? Well, Newcorch has been going for all these years. This is a picture of our 
Now, long departed friends, Eric and Dorothy from Helensboro, they used to stand many, many times at Balak and in other places watching for convoys. And we have a little rather obsessed team of people who will watch out for it on various drives. But also increasingly, we get calls from members of the public who actually see it, think that's something really unusual. What the heck's this? You know, they're stopped by the police and it comes past in front of them and they'll Google it and they'll work out what it is and then they'll ring us and tell us where it is. So that's really helpful. Um, so we keep all these records and we have been campaigning all these years. Um, so what are some of the safety issues around it? Well, as apart from the obvious dangers of a nuclear war, whether intentional or accidental, the transport of these weapons carries its own risks. Um, here in the central belt, you can see that it travels through really highly populated areas around the bypass, you know, through Glasgow. And it also comes on some pretty twisty, narrow B roads, particularly that road across from Stirling to Balak. Now, the Ministry of Defence issues this guidance, the Local Authority Emergency Services Information, LACI for short. Um, and they say in the event of a serious accident, the high explosives could detonate and disperse the radioactive material. It's clear from this that the MOD's priority would be looking after the weapons. And the MOD expects the response to our community safety to come from local authorities, fire, rescue, police and the health service. And also the Civil Contingencies Act of 2004 in Scotland here. Uh, places that responsibility firmly in the hands of these first responders, not the military. In their advice to the first responders, the MOD uh, say things like, you know, if there was a serious accident with a convoy, uh, you would have to evacuate all non-essential personnel to 600 metres. And some of the places, you know, the convoy is really close to where there are schools, where there is, is residential areas. And also you'd have to shelter everybody up to five kilometers downwind depend from the wind 45 degree arc from the wind direction so like if it's on the edinburgh bypass potentially you're talking about right into murrayfield into morningside and if it was where it's coming through the m8 through glasgow then obviously huge areas of, of glasgow the city center could be um, involved in, in asking people to take shelter quite who buy, we're not yet ever really got the answer. Um, so in 2016, Mark Ruskell, who I believe is with us this evening, um, his office, they did a survey of all the local authority areas in Scotland where the convoy comes through. And from those responses, uh, David McKenzie and I of Newtwatch published a report on Ready Scotland um, where we explained what the issues were and catalogued these woefully inadequate responses from the local authorities. Um, so in response to our report, there was then the Scottish Parliament had to debate about it and they conducted a review. But Newport is still not reassured the Scottish Government or local authorities have done a proper risk assessment themselves. And um, we find that their collusion with the MOD and the Westminster Government secrecy quite unacceptable. So finally, if anybody spots a convoy, if it passes where you are, or if you just happen to be out traveling, or you meet anybody that's seen one of these things and saying, what's this, then it's really important that you ring us because you might be the only one that's seen it. You might be the vital little, we always call it the, the, the piece of the puzzle. Sometimes we need the missing piece to just give us the information to log, where's this convoy gone? What's it up to? And so if you have these numbers, you can find them on our website, our Facebook, our Twitter account, they're all over. Um, and I'll put them in the chat afterwards. Right, I think that's me, that's the basics. Thank you, Kenneth. I have to stop sharing. Thank you very much, Jane, that was brilliant. Um, good kind of uh, introductory overview. Uh, and I see some questions already coming into the chat room. So if you've got any questions, we'll take those in the Q&A. Uh, we've got plenty of time for that and uh, just keep posting them in the chat room and we're monitoring those. So we're now going to hand over to Peter Burt and Peter is at the other end of the road basically and he's down in Reading and Peter's going to 
give us uh, some more background on the uh, why we're upgrading uh, and the new um, programme for Trident that's causing this increase in traffic and increase in potential warheads that the UK government's talking about. So over to you, Peter. Thank you very much indeed, Kenneth. And it's a great pleasure to be here this evening. And as, as Kenneth said, I'm the other end of the, uh, of the, the, the Nuke Watch chain, uh, here down in the south of England in Berkshire, uh, near the atomic weapons establishments where the UK's nuclear warheads are made. And um, down here over the past couple of days, we've just been opening up from COVID, as I believe you're soon due to do in Scotland. And um, I think people's minds are still very much focused on the NHS and a great feeling of gratitude to all the health workers who have helped us get through the, uh, the crisis. Um, if you follow the news, then you'll know that the government recently uh, awarded a pay rise to those workers, a pay rise of 1%, which is less than the cost of living increase at the moment. If you also follow the news, then you'll know that um, last month, the government published its integrated review of defence and foreign policy, and it announced that there would be a 40% increase in the number of UK nuclear warheads. Um, so, there's a big difference there. Um, health workers do protect us and don't get a big pay rise. Nuclear weapons don't protect us and do get a big increase. The government haven't published the reasons for why this increase is needed or how many will go on the submarines of the new warheads or how they would defend us. And another thing which the government hasn't told us is that um, among many other things, they haven't told us that the increase in warhead numbers is already underway and has been underway probably for at least two years and may indeed be nearly complete. So how do we know this? And the answer is we know this from counting convoys. So Emily, could you please show the table, please? Um, I'd like to show you all a table showing some figures with warhead numbers uh, over the past few years. Now, if you're not very good with numbers, don't worry, it's not gonna bite you. I'll talk you through it and explain what's happening here. Um, the important place to look in the first instance is down at the bottom where it says grand total. And these have got the figures for warhead convoys journeys going to Scotland and from Scotland all the way back from the year 2010 to the year 2020. So the first column shows the convoys going up from down here, the atomic weapons establishment up to you in Scotland. And you can see that over that period, there've been 43 convoys going up to Scotland. Now the second convoy gives figures going the other way. Um, and you can see that there's far fewer there. There's been only 35 convoys coming back down. So that tells us something. It tells us there's been a net delivery, uh, a net increase in delivery up to Scotland. But what's more interesting is if you break down the figures into the two halves of that decade. If you look at the figures for the first five years, the subtotals, then you can see that actually uh, over the period up to 2015, there were more warheads, more, more convoys going back to AWE than we're, going up to, than we're going up to Scotland. So we can infer that what was happening then was that warheads were actually being taken out of service at a very slow rate, which makes sense because that ties in with the commitment that the coalition government gave at the time to draw down the UK's nuclear warhead arsenal. However, it's a different picture if you look in the second half of the decade you can see that there are far more convoys going up than there were going down. 29 convoys going up to Scotland, only 17 going back down here to the south of England. And in fact, you see, particularly over the last couple of years, then that uh, discrepancy has been even more the case. And in fact, what we've seen over the past six months is that there has been a real rush to take warheads up to Scotland. Some of the convoys have not even sort of turned around and gone back to their garage before they've been loaded up again to take warheads up to Scotland. 
Um, we've also seen convoys traveling through the height of the COVID lockdown, going to a COVID hotspot in Argyll and Butte. So there's been a real push uh, under very bad circumstances to get those warheads up to Scotland. So what's been happening over the past five years is we think we're seeing evidence of a program that the government probably made a decision to take forward round about the same time it decided to build new Trident submarines um, in 2006 under the Blair government. Um, at the same time, a secret decision was made to upgrade the Trident warhead. Now that's not quite the same as the decision that, that was announced um, a year or so ago to build and design a new warhead. This is an upgrade of the existing warhead. So what we see in these figures for the second half of the decade is that warheads are bringing, being, being brought down from Scotland to AWE, <clears throat> upgraded and then sent back. And at the same time, newly manufactured warheads are also being sent back. Now, if you're very interested, then it's possible to do some sums and estimate the numbers of warheads involved. And we can calculate that possibly as many as 250 warheads out of the 260 ceiling that Boris Johnson announced a few, a few weeks ago, 250 of those warheads may already have gone to Coalport. If you're interested, there's a report with all the sums on the Nukewatch website. I'll put a link to that in the chat in a moment. So this really is why Nukewatch is important. We don't do the convoy watching just for fun. It certainly isn't much fun in the cold and dark and wet. Uh, we don't do it just to protest, although that's very important. The reason we do it is because it's the only independent way of verifying what is actually going on with the government's nuclear warhead programme. So that's why it's really important for us to know if a convoy's on the road. So Emily, could you show us the next slide, please? And um, here's a reminder of how to get in touch with us if you see a convoy. Please put the number in the phone now and the number for Nukewatch North in Scotland is the number shown. And don't hesitate to get in touch with us, whatever you see. So that's quite enough for me. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, that was great, Peter. Again, some very uh, useful information. Uh, there and again it sort of gives that sense of the frequency that was one of the questions that somebody's asked is how frequent you know those uh, convoys are on the road so that would give you a sense of how often they are kind of circa every six weeks approximately uh, and sometimes there's more sometimes there's less uh, in, in terms of that um, separation in time uh, and you know explaining you know that movement and what into the fact has been an increase in that those uh, second part of the, that decade which is very interesting certainly in Stirling we've been very aware of the convoys uh, coming through the town. So I'm now going to pass to David Cullen uh, and David's going to talk to us a bit more about what is actually happening at AWE uh, down in um, near Reading and the problems and that they're encountering there and some of the, the, the sort of new plans that are ahead. So over to you David, thank you. Thanks very much Kenneth. Can I just check that everyone can hear me okay? Uh, yes, I can hear you. That's great. Yep. Brilliant. I upgraded the internet in my house a couple of days ago and everything's worse. So apologies. And that's why I was slightly late, Johnny, but I'm, I'm glad you can all hear me. Um, Jane has talked very briefly at uh, Aldermaston and Burfield are the two main sites down, um, down near Reading. Uh, Burfield is primarily uh, warhead assembly and disassembly sites. Um, Aldermaston is the larger site and uh, at that site they do manufacturing of uranium and plutonium components, manufacturing of explosives and research. Um, the research that they do is, is the government substitute for nuclear testing, so they don't live test warheads anymore and they haven't since the 1990s, but they do have uh, a very large laser facility called Orion. Um, which is used to simulate the conditions uh, within a warhead during the moment of explosion. Um, and they have uh, giant supercomputers. They have some of the most powerful computers in the world. Computers are on it. Um, yeah, in, in the sort of between 100 and 200 in the ranking. 
Um, so they use those computers to do simulations of uh, nuclear warhead designs. Um, Peter's mentioned the um, upgrade, the upgrade that's ongoing, um, the current upgrades. Um, and as part of the program that that upgrade is a part of, they've um, been building new infrastructure at AWE. So the, the laser facility Orion I just mentioned was part of it, that's already complete. Um, the Warhead Assembly Facility, they're building a new one at um, Burfield called Mensa. Uh, you may have heard that it's gone catastrophically badly for them. So it was originally supposed to cost £730 million to build. It's currently looking at costing about £1.8 billion, and it's six years overdue. Um, they were, built, were planning to build a uh, uranium manufacturing facility at uh, Aldermaston called Pegasus. Um, they also have had some problems with that. That was due to cost £630 million. They paused it because they didn't have very much money. Um, they've just announced it's going to restart. Uh, and they, as part of that announcement, they've said they've spent nearly £300 million on that project. It's not clear how much of that has actually gone into useful work for them. They don't have... Or they, they maybe public a, a full... But so I mean, the AWE, as, as well as being a weapons of mass destruction factory, um, and as you can see by the numbers I've just given you, it's not very, hasn't been very well managed. Um, so as well as these, these long delays and these, these very high um, cost overruns, the sites are, which are regulated by the Office for Nuclear Regulation um, have been under enhanced regulatory attention since 2013. Um, this was a arrangement that was supposed to only last a couple of years originally. Um, it's now, I think, coming up to eight years. Um, and they're not expected to leave this year. They, they'll be leaving next year at the, uh, at the earliest. Um, last year, it emerged that one of the issues that's, as well as the delay in, in building some of these facilities, one of the issues that's keeping them in enhanced regulatory attention is their consistent failure to write safety cases on time so um, the way that it works and this is the same for all nuclear nuclear facilities they have to periodically write a very long detailed document justifying why um, particular facilities are safe to operate and AWE uh, we don't know the full details of how late they were for all of their safety cases but they were censored early last year for being 18 months late with a safety case. Um, I mean, just imagine if you're all being an organization with a turnover that's numbered in the billions and you can't get your act together for 18 months to write about how your nuclear weapons factory is safe to operate. That's that's literally a thing that's that's, that's happening at the moment. So this is one of the reasons why AWE um, was surprisingly under a Tory government announced to be renationalized last summer. Um, we believe it was a combination of ongoing failures to meet uh, proper safety standards, the huge wastage of money, but also the fact that the government was gearing up for spending more money at the sites and building a new warhead, and they basically run out of patience with the um, uh, with the contractors. So um, in June, I believe this year, uh, the site will go back into public ownership and. As I've just alluded to, the reason part of the reason for this is that they are going to build a brand new warhead. So this is separate from the current upgrade. It will be a longer term project. We don't yet have a budget or a timetable for it. Um, most of what we know about it is, is has come from the United States. In fact, um, the, the news was announced first in the United States by the American government <laughs> rather than in the UK. Very embarrassingly for the, the British government. Um, the reason for this is that it's a bit of parallel development with a new US warhead called the W93. Um, again, the W93, we don't know very much about it. Um, how large it will be in terms of explosive power, I, I think it's still up in the air. Um, the one thing that, that is, likely, is, is likely to operate on a longer range because it will be lighter than the current warhead, but be fitted on the same missiles. Um, we do know the level of dependency between the US and the UK, though we know that the UK took the unusual step of lobbying 
the US Congress to try and get funding for the W93. Um, and we also know that the W93 program has moved forward a couple of years. It's probably quite likely that they needed the Americans to decide some technical specifications before they could proceed with the UK warhead. Um, so that's that's what's currently on the horizon and that's what's currently happening at AWE. Okay, thanks very much, um, David. And I was certainly experiencing some cutting out there. I don't know who everybody else was as well in terms of your internet connection, but it could have been at my end, I'm not sure. Um, but I got most of that um, and some really, again, some really inf interesting information about where we're at uh, with uh, the, if, yep. Uh, if, if there was something specific you missed and you want me to say it again, I'm very happy to. No, it's okay. I, mean, I think I've got a, the gist of it and, I'm, and uh, I, I'm sure if there's any particular questions from people, I'm keen to take questions from people. Um, they are sort of coming in in the chat room. Um, so a uh, first question I had was, um, looking at the question about shelter and why no evacuation. Uh, and I, I wonder if that's, particularly you mentioned that, Jane, that there was this five kilometre shelter zone and you 